recording. All right, thank you, Jerry. So a little bit about me. I'm a naturalist here with Story County Conservation, and I actually got my degree in wildlife management and interpretation. So I do have a strong science background, but I am not a mycologist. Unfortunately, um, Iowa State University didn't offer any mycology courses at that time, which is a shame because I would have absolutely loved to have taken them. So um, I am in no way going to claim today that I am an expert. In fact, there's probably gonna be some people watching this that are um, have far more knowledge than I do. But what I am is a mushroom enthusiast. And I really hope today that I can grow your understanding of the basic ecology around fungus and teach you a few new fungus to find in the spring and hopefully get you to become an enthusiast as well. Where I've gained my knowledge is I started to become a mushroom hunter at the age of four. My mom and dad would take me out in the spring to hunt morel mushrooms. And that really fostered my love for finding things in the forest that are edible. And from that, I just um, fell in love with fungus. I think it's fascinating. I think it's weird and beautiful. Um, I'm just amazed by all the purposes it has in the world. So if you are looking for some expert experts, I wanted to first um, show you some great resources that you can expand your learning at. First of all, um, locally, we have this amazing Prairie States Mushroom Club. And what they do is uh, monthly forays and they go all across the state and they pick locations and send out the locations and meeting times. And there are some tremendous resources in this group. Uh, I'm just blown away by their knowledge and I got to attend a couple and I learned so much. So they do have a website, you can Google to find them. I, I high, highly encourage you to join. Another, and um, Angelique, if you could go ahead and mute yourself, that would be great. Um, another great resource is uh, online, mushroomexperts.com. I use that for IDing a lot. And as Facebook is becoming more and more uh, popular, a lot of groups are showing up. And this is a list of groups I encourage you to join. Um, there are some very knowledgeable people on these groups that can help with mushroom ID. But also, if you do post pictures, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Some are very knowledgeable and some are novice in making guesses. So. Um, you have to use your good judgment, but it's a great way to also connect with other fungus enthusiasts. So why should we even care about fungus? Well, I always like to tell people that um, fungus is going to save the world. In fact, our, our planet would not thrive and exist if it wasn't for fungus. And there's a many reasons why. So the first reason, um, Fungus is abundant. So we know that there is probably over 5.1 million species of fungus. And out of that 5.1 million, only about 100 to 200,000 have actually been identified. So fungus is everywhere. They also have an extremely important ecological role. Our earth would look like a dump site if it wasn't for fungus. It would be a stinky, smelly, messy place because fungus have a very important role in becoming decomposers, breaking down um, that dying matter and turning it into important nutrients in our soil. And they also have very important symbiotic relationships called mycorrhizae. And we'll talk about this a lot further, but basically a lot of trees and plants could not grow if it wasn't for this basic teamwork that happens with fungus. We are also learning more and more about the medicinal properties of fungus. A lot of studies are coming out using um, mushrooms and, and mushrooms have actually been used for decades across the world um, as medicine. I mean, a lot of us are very familiar that we get a lot of antibiotics from our fungus, but there's also fungus is being used to treat cancer. Um, this turkey tail mushroom down here, which is an Iowa native, um, is being used for its immune boosting properties. Um, I've actually known women who've undergone um, breast cancer treatment and I made them turkey tail 
um, tonics to help boost their white blood cell count. And their doctors were just amazed at, at how well they were doing. And that's just you know an anecdotal so story, but the research is out there as well. Um, this mushroom up here called lion's mane, um, Aramecium, is a really hot topic in science right now. Um, this mushroom is being shown to uh, have the ability to regenerate neurons in the brain. So it's being used to help treat dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, and then John Hopkins University is actually using psychedelic mushrooms to treat depression and anxiety and schizophrenia. Fungus also has a, a huge economic value, whether it's you know, positive or negative. So a lot of our crops um, that sometimes can, can get parasitized by um, uh, smuts and ruts and blights, that's a type of fungus, you know, it could cost the agricultural industry about $60 billion in loss, which is pretty significant. But on the other side of that, if you just look at yeast alone, it's a $900 billion industry. So fungus also really greatly influences our economy. And then there's just, you know, the food role that they, they play. They are, um, are an important part of our nutrition. We get a lot of nutrients from them, like vitamin D and vitamin E. And we get that in the form of mushrooms and then, you know, the fermentation of bread and cheeses and alcohol. So to, to really kind of boost our enthusiasm, um, I, I put together just three questions that sometimes I get asked a lot. Um, and I am going to test your mushroom knowledge. So I'm going to just give you guys a chance to think about them and if you think these are true or false. So the first question I get asked and come across a lot is um, most mushrooms are poisonous, so you should not touch them. So just you can kind of answer to yourselves of whether you think that is true or false. Well, the answer to this one is false. And I come across this question a lot, especially when I'm giving field trips and um, a kid comes across a mushroom and touches it and picks it up and mom or dad go, no, put that down, put that down, it's poisonous. Um, you can, it, it is true that many mushrooms are poisonous, but you cannot absorb those toxins through your skin. Um, mushrooms are completely um, safe to touch. In fact, a lot of them are fun to touch because they have a lot of different textures. And many um, mushroom hunters, that is a great way that a tool you're going to use to ID the mushroom because a lot of times you either have to dig it out of the soil, you have to examine the cap or under the cap. So you can um, touch mushrooms. You can smell mushrooms. A lot of ways we're going to use to ID mushrooms is actually through smell. And, um, and some mushroom hunters can even um, you know, break off a piece of that mushroom and taste it and then spit it out. Because sometimes you know, certain mushrooms are so similar, you have to see if they're bitter or not to be able to see if you're correctly identifying it. So all those methods are safe. Um, the only exception to that, I would say, is you know, if you find a puffball mushroom that's old and dry and releasing spores, probably wouldn't want to smell that because you wouldn't want to inhale those spores and have allergic reaction. But if you see a cool mushroom, go ahead and touch it. It's completely fine. Next question. Mushrooms only have a nutritional value if you cook them. Is this true or false? So this one is true. As I said before, mushrooms have a lot of nutritional value, but in order for our bodies to actually absorb those important vitamins that you can get for them, you have to cook them. See, mushrooms have a hard outer uh, wall made out of a polysaccharide called chitin. And chitin is the same thing that forms the exoskeletons of like scorpions and crabs. So it's very, very tough. So in order for us to get any nutrients, we have to use an enzyme reaction heat to break down those walls to get the nutrients. So even those mushrooms you get from the store, like the white button mushrooms, and you cut them up and put them on your salad, even though they're delicious, and it's not going to harm you, um, you're not going to gain anything from that. So um, and as a good general rule, anyways, I always tell people to cook mushrooms, but, and especially any wild mushrooms that you're finding regardless. 
All right, last question. The largest organism in the world is a fungus. Is this a myth? Is this true or is this false? So a lot of people think that the largest living organism in the world is the great blue whale. And though that the, that is the largest animal in the world, the largest organism is actually a fungus called a honey fungus. And this is found in Oregon. And the underground structure of this fungus called a mycelium actually spreads across 3.4 miles. So it's humongous. And scientists did studies and it is all one organism. It is all genetically the same. And this is actually an edible species, a very delicious one. And we do have this in Iowa as well. So now what I want to talk about is some of the basic characteristics of fungus. Um, it's important to kind of have this background to help you become a better um, forager or get better at IDing fungus. So what is a fungus's closest living relative, right? If we look at this cladogram and we see what most recently branches off from fungi, it is actually animals. We are more closely related to fungus than plants. And we're gonna learn about why. Why are fungi not plants? Well, first of all, fungus cannot photosynthesize. They cannot take energy from the sun and convert it to food for themselves. They are eukaryotic, meaning they are multicellular and those cells have organelles like a nucleus. And as I said before, the cell walls of fungus are made out of chitin, where the cell walls of plants are made out of cellulose. Um, most fungi are multicellular cellular, except for yeast. Those are unicellular and they are a type of fungus. And fungus also lack um, roots, stems, or leaves. And we'll learn the differences here in a second. Fungi are considered absorptive, absorptive heterotrophs, meaning what they're gonna do is they're gonna digest their food first outside their body, and then they're gonna absorb it. And they're gonna do this through digestive enzymes that's gonna break down that organic matter or the material on their host and then they're going to absorb that and transfer it into a carbohydrate called glycogen, which is like sugar. We can have all kinds of different types of fungi, and we're going to take a basic look at all the groups of fungi and see how diverse they are. But they can be puffballs and yeasts and mushrooms and rusts and smuts and ringworm and molds. And many of you probably know that our common antibiotic penicillin actually is a fungus that comes from Molt. So one thing you're going to discover as you um, move forward and learning more about fungus and you want to learn how to identify fungus, a lot of ID books are going to describe how those fungus actually are getting their nutrition. So they might be described as saprobes, and these are um, decomposers. So they're gonna live off of a dying or dead organism and they're gonna help decompose that. So a lot of our molds and mushrooms are actually saprobic. Some fungus are parasitic, meaning they're gonna live off of a host and oftentimes they're gonna harm those hosts. So a lot of the fungi that affect our crops are parasites and they're gonna attack that plant. But they could also be parasites on us. Um, if any of you have ever had the unpleasant experience of having ringworm, that is a fungal infection, it's not an actual worm. Or some people get uh, fungal infections in their nails or their toenails. And then lastly, fungi can be mutualistic, meaning both the host and the fungus benefit each other. So a great example of this are lichens. Um, lichens is actually a combination of an algae and a fungus. So when you see those, you're actually seeing two different organisms working together. And you can see these on the side of trees, on rocks, they're, they're prolific everywhere. And then mycorrhizae, which is actually a fungus growing on a plant or tree root. And the trees, well, so let's say it's a tree root, the fungus grows on that root and helps give that tree a lot of important 
nutrients, it helps break down the soil around it. And in return, that tree roots is giving the fungus some important carbohydrates. Now these mycorrhizae associations are so important because a lot of times certain mushrooms are only gonna be found around certain plants. So a great example of this is called hen of the woods. This is a fall edible, absolutely delicious. And typically the only place you're gonna find this mushroom is at a base of an oak tree because they have that important relationship with the oak tree's roots. And this is very, very common amongst mushrooms. So the parts of the fungi, the main part that makes up the fungus are called hyphae. And they're very thin filaments um, and they're very long and thread-like and they branch out. And then when you get a mass of those hyphae, um, those form what is called a mycelium. And it's a big web and this is the bioactive part of hyphae, meaning this is the feeding part. This is the part that's gonna do all that absorption of food. And if you've ever um, put um, mulch out on your garden or around your flowers, and maybe you've seen what looks like this um, uh, kind of moldy thing spanning across it, that's actually mycelium. And if you wait a little while, that will probably pop up some mushrooms for you to see. Um, and it is actually thought of that 80% um, of the earth under our feet is mycelium. So it just shows you again, how abundant fungus is among us. So if we look at this again, here's the makeup of the mushroom. It's all that hyphae and it starts to go underground. And then as it branches out, here's the feeding part, the mycelium. So the part above ground here, this is the reproductive structure. This is the mushroom, which a lot of people ask, what is the difference between a fungus or a mushroom? Well, the mushroom, the part growing out of the ground, you can think of it as like the fruit, okay? That is the reproductive structure. We call it the fruiting, fruiting body, okay? And the part below ground would be the mycelium. And you can kind of associate that as the roots. That's what's gonna do all the absorption and, and getting the nutrients so that fruiting body can be produced. So all mushrooms are fungi, but not all fungi can actually produce mushrooms. And are there any questions so far? I just kind of want to pause a moment. So if anybody wants to raise their hand and ask a question about what we've been talking about or use the chat. Yes, you mentioned that you can't get toxins through your skin. If you were to touch a poisonous mushroom and then put your fingers to your mouth, would that make a difference or not? Typically not. In order to get those toxins, um, you, you have to consume it and absorb it. And, uh, and a lot of the toxins that are in mushrooms, what it's typically going to affect is actually your liver, at least the really bad ones. Um, you know, some of them will just cause gastric ups, upset, but in order for that to happen, they actually have to be digested. Of course, there's always some exceptions to that, but it's pretty rare. So great question. All right. Well, if there's no other questions, I'm gonna go ahead and continue forward. So a lot of you were wanting to know some surefire ways to be able to tell if a mushroom is edible or poisonous. And you know, I, I get this question a lot and people say, oh, well, if it's red, that means it's definitely poisonous. Well, that's not true. There, there really is no surefire way to know if a mushroom is edible or poisonous because there is always, always exceptions. So the general rule amongst mushroom hunters is you need to make sure that you 100% identify the mushroom before you consume it. And if you're not sure, ask an expert, okay? Because there is no rule of thumb, there is no 100% way. When you are learning to mushroom hunt and identify um, fungus, um, it's important to know the different parts. So the picture I'm showing you is a, is a common depiction of a mushroom. But any of you who have ever been out into the forest, you know not all mushrooms are going to look this way. Um, some are shelf fungus, some are, are just 
you know, look like ears, some just look like jelly masses. So this doesn't hold true for everything, but this is gonna give us a basic understanding. So if we look at the top here, this is called the cap of the mushroom. And it's, um, caps can come in all kinds of different colors and shapes and textures. Some are really slimy. Some can be really hard and scaly. Some can be oozing. Um, and, you know, some colors can indicate that it's poisonous, don't eat me as a warning, but some are also trying to attract animals to eat them to spread their spores. So you can't always go by color if, if a mushroom is poisonous or not. And the purpose of the cap is to protect what's underneath it. And that's where the important fruiting body is, the gills, or it could be uh, tubes, or it could be pores, it could look very spongy or like that lion's mane that I showed us in the beginning that's used to treat dementia, it can have teeth. So um, all the undersides can look different and um, that's what's gonna produce the spores. And as we, oops, I mean to do that. As we go down the, the mushroom, then you have what is called a stalk. And you can kind of think of that, do not need to do that, as the, uh, like the stem. Um, but we would call it a stock or a stipe. Now these next two features, not all mushrooms have this, but I'm gonna teach this to you guys because um, a lot of the, the poisonous families of mushrooms do tend to have this. So it can be a way, it can be a way to help you figure out if it might be a poisonous species. But as I say, there are always exceptions. So what I'm talking about is what is called the ring and the vulva. And I'm gonna explain this a little bit further on the next page. So some mushroom families like amaryllis and amanitas and stinkhorns, they start as this little egg shape. And you probably have seen these in your garden, in your yard, okay? And this is what we would call a universal veal. And the purpose of that is to protect all of the mushroom until it has all the energy it needs to start growing. So as it grows, and you can see this is a death cap mushroom, it's a member of the Amanita family. It's one of the deadliest mushrooms you can consume or wouldn't want to consume. And you can see the little cap starting to pick up and the veal is still attached to it. And here's the stalk starting to stick out a little bit more. You can still see that the veal is attached. And now here's the stalk and the cap of the mushroom. And there's still a veal on the underside here. And its job is to protect those gills until the spores are ripe and ready to spread. So as it grows, once that veal detaches from the cap, it makes a ring or an annulus. And we just call it a ring. So sometimes when I'm teaching new beginners about finding mushrooms, I say, if you're not sure if it has a ring, don't pick it, just leave it be. Um, or pick it and we'll ID it, but definitely don't consume it until we know for sure what it is. Um, so a lot of members of the Amanita family will have that ring around them. Again, I know also of edible mushrooms that have that ring as well. So it's not a guarantee, but it's a good start. So if we look at that a little further, again, here's the egg, here's that partial veal, and when the mushroom continues to grow, this will move kind of further down the stike, stipe, the stalk. And then here's the vulva. This is the what's left of that universal veal that's remained in the ground here. So you, again, you can kind of see that growth here. So in ID books, when they're talking about partial veal or universal veal, this is what they're talking about. So if we look at some stink horns, these are super common, especially in, in uh, mulched areas. You can see this a little further. And what's cool about these groups is these stinkhorns, their veals can make these beautiful, beautiful shapes. This is called a bridal stinkhorn. Um, some of the veals can look like a, like a, a basket or a lacy nest. Um, it's really, really neat. And um, I also get questions when we're looking and sometimes um, people will find, you know, a mushroom that looks like this and they're like, oh, look, it's got mold growing on it. Nope, that's still that partial veal. It's still um, peeling off of it. So that's what you're looking at.
and again, the whole point of that veal and, and those gills are, are to create spores. And spores are um, the mushrooms adaption to being on land. And um, this is how they're going to ensure that they are going to disperse to new locations. And so it, it's basically like a seed. It's the reproductive part of the mushroom. And they cannot move on their own, same as seeds. So they are going to rely on wind, water, animals, and insects. And depending on their mode of dispersal, it's going to determine what kind of shape that spore is going to be in. And if we look here at the right, this is what is called a gem studded puffball. And these puffballs will release just trillions of spores. So if you see any puffballs in the woods or in your yard and they're turning brown, I always tell people, leave it, kick it around, spread those spores, come back the next year. Then you'll have like, you know, anywhere from three to 12 of those puffballs that you can then pick and consume. So um, what's really neat, and I'm hoping, yay, good, um, is that, um, so what's really neat about some mushrooms too, specifically cup fungi, it's a mushroom that's like shaped like a cup, is if you find one, you can take it and you can hold it up to the sun or you can blow on it and it's gonna look like it's steaming. And what is it's doing is it's re releasing its spore. So I'm hoping this video works for us. So um, really cool to come across, even here at the park, um, some of our, our neat oyster mushrooms were high up in a tree and the sun was hitting them just right and it just looked like it was steaming all day. It was really cool. But what I think is amazing about this mechanism is, is the G-force required to release these spores. So scientists have studied this and um, it have found that this is actually the strongest G-force ever recorded on our planet. So to put this in perspective for you, for us to send a person in, into space, the G-force that astronaut endures is around uh, uh, four Gs, okay? To release these spores, that's about 180,000 Gs. So they put a lot of um, strength into their mechanism to make sure that these spores are released and, and can travel far from the parent. Fungus also undergo, oh, here it is. I was afraid that was gonna happen. Um, a couple of different life cycles. They can reproduce asexually and sexually. And this is just a very, very simple diagram of how the sexual lifestyle um, life cycle would work. So you have your mature mushroom and here's the gills or the pores that would release the spores. Um, and again, that stalk, why grow upwards? Well, it's to get that cap high enough so wind can get under it to release those spores. So then the spores are gonna be released and they might drift away through wind or water or plants. And hopefully they're gonna land somewhere that's very damp and moist. And when that happens, they're gonna start making those hyphae that we talked about. And then a male and female hyphae, if they meet, they will merge together and that will form a mycelium which is again, is that absorptive part of the mushroom. And then eventually, if it has enough nutrients and the conditions are right, it'll grow upwards and start the cycle over again. And that's just a very, very basic overview. It's a little more complicated than that. And I just do not want to spend the time talking about that today. So when you start learning about mushrooms and their classifications, because you're going to see these in your guidebooks, you know, they're going to be grouped into all different types of groups like Basidiomycota, Ascomycota, Zygosporangia. And the way they are grouped is basically by the structure of their fruiting bodies, of their reproductive parts, their spores. And, you know, if we look at like Basidiomycota right here, um, these are called the club fungi because they think their basidias look club like. Or the Ascus or the cup fungi. Are, are called that because their spores are cup-like. So that is how a lot of these groups are getting their name. And if we look at the main groups, these are the major groups. 
And I'm, I'm not going to spend time talking about these individual groups, but what I have done is in, in the PDF I'm gonna send you, um, I've detailed all the differences in the groups and some examples and um, how they're good and how they can be bad. So you can learn about that later because some of you did have that question, but for us to talk about that today, I mean, we would need all day. So, um, but here are the basic groups and uh, some examples. So morels are considered sac fungi or that cup fungi. You know, the puffballs we talked about, those are the Bicidiomycotas. Um, Cytrides, these are an aquatic fungus that are decomposers. And then the Detromycota, you know, think of, of our skin. These are things that um, affect humans. So here's that ringworm that I was talking about, which is a fungus that um, is incredibly itchy and contagious. And if any of you have ever brought home a farm kitty, you've probably experienced this. Um, and then our common molds, like our bread molds, belong to the zygomycotas. And then um, some guidebooks even go into talking about the different type of mycorrhizae, so the fungus growing on the roots of the plants and the trees, and then our lichens as well. So that's how they're grouped together. So here's the fun stuff. Going out the spring, finding some of these cool mushrooms. So what I've tried to do is um, pick just six mushrooms that um, I get the most questions about in the springtime. So things that people are commonly coming across or want to find. So the first one, as I'm sure you can all imagine, is going to be the morel mushroom. Um, so a, a, an amazing edible species, um, kind of difficult to find. And um, I don't know about you guys, but when I grew up learning how to mushroom hunt, you know, I learned that, okay, early, early mushroom season, you're gonna find the grays. And then you're gonna find this other type of morel mushroom, which is the yellow. And at the very end, you're gonna find the giant yellows that look like giant ice cream cones. And in a lot of guidebooks, these are classified as different species of mushrooms. Well, now they're starting to find, they're not different species of mushrooms, they're just in different stages. Um, they're actually all genetically the same. So now some guidebooks are, are just grouping them together as Marcella Americana. So it, it all depends on the guidebook that you're looking at. Um, so these, these are actually found in um, spring. So depending on the weather conditions, you could start finding them in March and, and, or you might not start finding them until May. And when they do start popping up, they usually only last three to four weeks. Again, kind of based on how mushroom conditions are doing. And they're going to start when um, the nighttime soil temps are consistently um, between 40 to 60 degrees. Um, and a rule of thumb that, um, you know, there's all kinds of little different riddles out there, but I tend to know when um, the oak leaves are about the size of a squirrel's ear, or when I see um, a plant called may apples coming out of the ground, or when the lilacs are blooming. Those are those are good indicators for me that it, it's mushroom time and, and to hit the forest. And um, as I was saying before, um, the little grays, this is actually just the immature form of the yellows. Okay. So I get a lot of questions about that. Um, a lot of you wanted to know, where do I go to find morel mushrooms? And no mushroom hunter is going to say, here's my spot, go, this is where you're going to find morels. And if you do find somebody that's willing to do that, they're very generous. That's a great friend. Keep them around. Um, so generally, just hit a, hit a wooded area, hit a forested area, um, anywhere where um, you can find oaks or aspens or ash trees and especially dead elms. There seems to be an association with um, these mushrooms and dead elms. With that said, um, I have found these in some incredibly random places. I have found morels in rock piles. I have found them under cedar and pine trees. Um, a lot of people say, uh, swear by going to apple orchards. Um, I've, I haven't had any luck with that. Um, I've heard some people say around cemeteries along um, the fence line. Um, they've had success with that or along fence lines in general. Um, 
after a uh, a burn after um, a season before if there was a burn and that could just because be because the vegetation so low they're easy to find but there might be also something to um, after a burn there's a little more recycled nutrients into the soil um, my I had the most luck these last few years because it's been so dry, I would hit really mossy areas because then I knew there was enough moisture for these mushrooms. Mushrooms are 90% water, so they need lots and lots of moisture in order to grow. So what are you gonna look for? If this is a new one for you, you wanna look for that honey cap shape. I tell kids they kinda look like brains on a stick. And when you cut them open, they're going to have a nice hollow stalk. And then when you look at the, the stalk and where it meets the cap, they're fused together like this. And this is important to see because of some of other morel mushroom lookalikes, which I'm going to talk about next. But before I move on to the lookalikes, is there any questions about this common morel, this yellow morel mushroom that any of you would like to know? Jess, this is Jerry. I don't see any comments from any of the participants, but I have one. Sure. Uh, so, you know, I've had people, to, since it is related to soil temperature and moisture, um, I've had people in the past tell me that early on, you know, look at south facing slopes as opposed to north facing, and then look at the top of the hill. And as it warms up, you move down the hill. Do you have any experience with that? Um. Yes, yes. And I, and I say that that is generally good advice based on um, where the sun is hitting and getting the most heat. And then yes, as, as the season gets later, I tend to hit north facing slopes and where they're going to be more shaded that way. Um, they don't dry out and certain, you know, once soil temps and weather temps get above that 75 80 range, these guys tend to stop growing. So you want to find in later season where it stays cooler. Yep, thanks for asking that, Jerry. So, yes, yeah, so what you're saying is start on the south facing slopes early in the season and end on the north facing slopes later in the season. Absolutely, yes. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to move on to this mushroom's lookalike. And this is called a half free morel, Morchella punctipes. And this is also an edible species, but I always cautious, caution people because it does have a poisonous lookalike. And this differs because um, this one has a really long stalk compared to our common morel that we just learned about. And if we look at where that cap is, it's halfway attached to the stalk. So if we compare this to its poisonous lookalike, uh, and again, it has a hollow inside, so the false morel, um, which isn't a morel at all, it's a verpa bohemica. These are sometimes called early morels. So if you see these, um, they're gonna be in the same location and in the same time frame as all the other morels, um, but they might show up just a little bit earlier. But if you see them, you know, that, that's a good thing too, because that means you're in the right area, you're in the right uh, conditions to find that yellow morel that's so delicious. Um, as I said before, it's not an actual morel species. And um, it looks like that other half free morel. And if you look inside it, one way to tell the difference is it's got a very cottony inside. It's not hollow at all. And um, the cap is only attached to the top of the stalk. And we'll see that a little bit better in the next slide. Um, I have seen guidebooks and that say that these are edible and I have heard of people eating them, but having um, certain reactions like a very, very drunk like state. Um, or or having some gastric upset so I generally just tell people they're poisonous and to be you know very, very cautious about consuming them. So if we put these together so here's that false morale. And if we look inside, um, it is not hollow. It's got that cottony mass and a cap attaches to the very top of the stalk. And here's the edible half free morel, very long stalk, 
whoops, sorry about that, um, hollow inside and the cap goes halfway down the stock. And then here's our delicious yellow morel. And um, the, the cap and the stock are fused, it's hollow inside. So that's how you're gonna tell the differences between them. And if you're just not sure, just stick to the, yellow, the common morel. Those are easy enough to identify. Another question I get a lot are about these Gyamitra species. And a lot of people call them false morels, and those are not false morels, they are Gyamitras. And um, they're not in the Mortella family. They are found in the same habitats as the, the, the true false morel and the hefri and the common morel, um, same time frame as well. So if you find these, again, you're in a place that has the right condition for morel mushrooms. Um, when you cut these open, they're not gonna be hollow inside um, and they're gonna be very, very brittle and um, they fall apart. There is a lot of debate on this mushroom's edibility. Um, so some people call them beef steaks and they do eat them and don't have any problems. Um, but some people, if they don't cook them the right way, uh, they can have some gastric upset. So I, I just tend to steer people away from them. I don't think they taste very good anyways, but some people do enjoy them. Uh, the two common species we have here in Iowa is the Gyamitra brunia, and it kind of looks flatter and more like pancake-like. And then the Gyamitra carolina, which is much more brain-like and a lot more reddish in color compared to that orange tone. Um, the reason why you want to properly identify these, though, is um, it's rare to find in Iowa, but it can occasionally happen, is um, there is something called Gyamitra esculante, and that one is definitely poisonous. Um, and what happens is when you cook that one, um, that substance in it, in it called Gyamitra gets converted to something called um, monomethyl hydrazine, which is what's used in rocket fuel. And some people have um, been hospitalized just from inhaling the fumes from that, from that enzymic reaction of creating that rocket fuel. And, um, and it has been known to even kill a few people. So again, rule of thumb with mushrooms, 100% um, make sure you can identify it. And two, make sure you are cooking them thoroughly in a, in a proper way. Um, another thing with trying new mushrooms as well is just because one person has a reaction to it doesn't mean that another person is going to have the same reaction. So a great example of this is morel mushrooms. So first of all, our classic morel um, are poisonous until you cook them. You need that heat to break down the toxins inside the mushroom. I can eat morel mushrooms all day, every day and be completely fine. My coworker, if she even takes a bite of one, she's going to spend her day in the bathroom having a terrible, terrible day. So. One of the rules is when you're trying a new mushroom, just try a little bit at a time. So maybe you try a morel, you try one, and you wait six hours and see if you have a reaction. If you're fine, you could try a couple more, wait a couple of days. If you don't have a reaction, you're probably not going to be allergic to that mushroom. So um, you're gonna wanna apply that to any edible mushroom species. Another um, beautiful, common mushroom that more and more people are talking about and I get lots of questions is what is called a golden oyster. And here in Iowa, we have golden oysters and then we have another species called a white oyster. And basically the only difference is the color. But the reason why these are um, newsworthy is um, uh, one, they're just now showing up. Um, so first of all, you can find this throughout the spring and fall. It's a delicious edible. They grow abundantly. So if you find a, a tree or a log with these growing on them, you can take all of those, come back in a week or two, and it's going to be right back there growing again. And sometimes this happens season after season. So um, it is a great food source and an abundant one. 
but these are not the golden oysters aren't actually native to Iowa. These are from Russia and China and Japan. And up until 2011, we didn't even have this mushroom here. And what is that happen is um, during 2011, when Hurricane Irene hit, it flooded an area that was growing these mushrooms as a cultivar. And when it flooded, it carried the spores into surrounding areas. And then this mushroom just took off and started spreading everywhere. And the concern is now that it's, it's actually becoming an invasive species because it, it grows um, so abundantly and so quickly that it's actually out competing, out competing our native white oyster mushroom. So I, I'm kind of curious what's going to happen to this mushroom if you know if there's going to be a campaign to get rid of them or if we're just um, yeah I, I'm not sure what's going to happen with these species, but they are delicious and I've enjoyed them a lot. Another one uh, I get called about every single year is uh, this pheasant back or dryad saddle. Um, these are um, growing the same time in the same place as the morel mushrooms. So if you see this mushroom, um, it's a good indicator that you're in the right area again for morel mushrooms. Um, they get their name because of the, the color and pattern kind of reminds people of, of a bird foliage there. Um, kind of has that pheasant look. Or sometimes they're called dryad saddles. A dryad is a, is a fairy. So it kind of looks like a saddle they were riding on. And uh, these are edible, so but you only want to eat them when they're nice and young and fresh. So if you find one this big, that's not going to be any good. Um, Jerry can tell you they're very, very leathery and hard to eat. So what you're going to want to find is something about the smaller, um, about the size of the palm of your hand. That is a good si size to find them. And a great way to ID them is if you take a little piece of them off, they're actually gonna smell like watermelon rind or cucumber. And it's a very distinct smell. And they even kind of carry that flavor even after you cook them, it's kind of a sweet flavor. So that, that's a fun one to find. And these will last throughout the season. You know, you can even find these up through fall. So scarlet elf cups. I love this mushroom because it's so common and it's so bright and red and it grows all over the forest floor. So people, a lot of people find them and comment on them, um, especially kids. And um, there, there's many different varieties of these and there's only little microscopic differences to be able to identify them. So they are saprobic, meaning they're gonna be found on decaying twigs on, on the ground. And they're generally associated with certain trees. Um, a lot of times you can find these um, growing on basswood twigs, but there's always, um, you know, I, I find them on hickory twigs and oak tw twigs as well. And some, um, some books and, and some countries, these are actually considered edible. And um, I've even seen some videos of people in, in England going out and hunting these and just eating them raw. But I, I would, I'd always caution people and say, Make sure you know what you're identifying and make sure you cook it. So this is one of my favorite ones. Um, we kind of learned about this a little bit earlier too, but it's the stinkhorn family in particular, the dog stinkhorn. And I get calls about this all the time and it it's, gets its name because it resembles a certain doggy's body part. And uh, you can find these in a lot of wood chipped areas and mulched areas. So that's why I always get a lot of phone calls about them because people see them growing in their garden and going, what is this? Um, and as I said earlier, they have just really amazing structural diversity. It's like that, you know, lacy bridal veal that we saw earlier. Um, and they are very, very slimy and they're called stink horns because they do emit an odor. And their whole job is to basically attract flies to spread spores. So if you do have a mulched area and you start seeing those little white eggs popping up everywhere, um, chances are you're gonna see a bunch of these stink horns. And they are inedible as well. And I'm pretty sure they don't look very appetizing anyways. Um, I have heard of people in the egg form eating those when prepared correctly, but I wouldn't recommend it. 
All right, and the last one I wanted to end on today are called um, bruising bolites, and these are part of the bolete family. So a bolete is a, a special group of mushrooms that their stalk is very, uh, excuse the pun, but stocky here. And uh, they're really, really fat. And their underside is aren't gills at all. They're going to be pores. And um, there are many, many edible varieties in the bolete family. Um, and they're absolutely delicious. Um, for example, porcinis are part of the bolete family. Um, but there are some poisonous ones too, but not deadly, you know, poisonous as in it would cause you some gastric upset. But what's really cool about this mushroom is if you, if you find some of them, especially if they're yellow in color, if you cut them open, they turn blue. So I wanted to show you this video here. So some of them, they will rapidly turn blue or sometimes they kind of slowly turn blue. Um, and it's thought the reason why they do this is because if an animal were to bite into them, that oxidative reaction is gonna taste really, really bitter and would basically discourage the animal from eating it. Um, some people say out there, anything that turns blue is poisonous, don't eat it. Well, that's not true either. There are some mushrooms in the bullet family that turn blue that are edible, but there are also some that are considered poisonous as well. So that's when you would really want to use your ID book and really go through all the characteristics to make sure you're collecting the correct mushroom. So those are the main ones I wanted to talk about today. I didn't want to overwhelm you with mushrooms um, because I could just go on and on and on. So, and I also wanted to leave some time for questions. So um, now is a good time that there's anything I didn't talk about or if anything you want me to talk about further that you wanted to know. So again, feel free to use the raise your hand or use the chat. Or you could just unmute yourself and start talking. I've got a couple of people that have just said outstanding presentation and thanks, but no questions on the chat, Jess. Okay, here's coming in from awesome. uh, from Carrie. Is the uh, is that Prairie States group just in Iowa? Not quite sure what that means. Um. I believe they do um, have groups in Wisconsin and Illinois as well, um, but I'm not positive on that. Oh, that's the mushroom group. Okay, gotcha. Yes. I'm not seeing any hand raises or any other questions being posted, Jess. All right, so we're either shy or I just covered everything needed to know. Um, like I said before, like this is a topic that is so extensive. I mean, it, it could be a semester long course, but I really hope that this gave you some of a basic understanding about how fungus works, how fungus is classified, and, and to get you a little more enthusiastic and maybe a little more confident to go out there and just start discovering fungus of your own. Like even if you're not wanting to eat mushrooms, um, it's they're everywhere and, and they're so diverse and, and can be incredibly beautiful in different colors and it's just fun to explore and see what's out there. So I, I hope many of you do that. And if you have any further questions, you have my contact information, feel free to, to call me up, um, send me an email. I can't guarantee I'll know the answer, but I can certainly send you to the right place to people who might. And uh, as I said before, I'll be sending out the recording and the PDF of all these slides later. So, Jess, I, got, I have two questions that popped up. Great. 
One is, what is your favorite mushroom and preparation technique? And the second one is, when is your next presentation? Maybe we ought to think about a midsummer one and then a fall one. I don't know. But uh, what is your favorite mushroom and preparation? Oh, OK. So that's hard. Um, I love so many of them. But I think taste-wise, well, I think I, I have to stick with the classic morel mushroom because that's what I grew up doing. And I take time off work to go hunt them. and. Um, it's so challenging sometimes because I could spend hours in the wood and some woods and sometimes only come back with a couple of mushrooms. And I think the challenge of it um, and the excitement of finding them is so fun and, and sharing that with kids and my family. And it's also just a, an amazing memory because it's something I used to um, do with my father um, who's passed away now. So anytime I go out morel mushroom I, hunting, I feel a real connection of being with my father again. Um, so I love that one, and I love that one um, that I showed a picture of called Hen of the Woods. And I think taste-wise, that one's my favorite. It has a real buttery, woody flavor. And uh, morels, my favorite way um, is just to bread them and fry them up, but also I love to um, cook them in olive oil with asparagus and then put them on um, a sandwich with some sun-dried tomatoes and smoked gouda and melt it all together and it's just oh it's amazing so those are my favorite and um i tend to do a fall foraging workshop because um in the fall there is an abundance of edible mushrooms um like that hen of the woods and um many many others so uh look keep a look out this fall and i'll i'll have more to talk about Any, Any other tips? questions, Jerry? Uh, one more question. There seems to be a little bit of issue with your microphone, too. It's getting soft. Um, oh, okay. Any tips for hunting mushrooms while minimizing our impact uh, on the nature we're coming in contact with? That's a great question. Um, and it's a tricky one. Um, there, there is like a foraging ethic. Um, and part of that is, first of all, if if you go to an area, um, you want to make sure that you're not, you're not tromping through um, ecologically important areas. So, for example, if if I'm out here at McFarland Park and I see just a bunch of wildflowers, um, I, I I try not to go tromping through those. I you know and, and reduce my impact that way. Um, another part of the foraging ethic is um, you only harvest from areas where that resource is abundant and also you only take a third of what's there so and and also understanding the rules and regulations of the park you're in so for example in a lot of um, public lands and conservation parks you're not allowed to harvest plants so a lot of times if people are out here morale mushroom hunting that is fine you can take mushrooms you can take nuts you can take berries but a lot of times I see people that are out morel mushroom hunting and around the same time we have this delicious wild edible called ramps or wild leeks. And I see people taking those as well. And you know, I have to remind them it's fine to take the mushrooms, but please leave the plants because those are protected here. Um, now, if you were to go to a private land and you were to see a bunch of those wild leeks um, and they're quite abundant, yes, you can take those and you know, you would take the, you know the rule of one third so you're leaving some for plant propagation and for wildlife where that gets hard is you know with certain mushrooms um you know especially morels you're you might only find one or two so how do you only leave a third of those so that's where it gets tricky um so with morel mushrooms if there's some older ones i i like to leave those so you know they can keep producing their spores um so if, if I find a bunch of morels, I try to leave one or two um, with some of the like hen of the woods or some of these shelf fungus that are edible. I, I, I like to leave half of that um, shelf fungus there to continue to grow. Um, with uh, morel mushrooms, there's some mushroom hunters to say like never, you know, never hunt with a plastic bag. You should only bring onion sacks so you can spread the spores. 
Um, there might be some truth to that, um, um, mainly because yes, it allows the spores to, to travel through, but chances are as well, um, plants are uh, animals and wind have already dispersed a lot of the spores. You probably even have some of them on your clothes and you're dispersing them that way. Um, you know, I avoid the plastic sack simply because I don't want my mushrooms to get mushy and um, get really dirty. So those are some things to be mindful of. Um, yeah, I hope I answered that um, well enough. There's a lot of things to consider. Jess, if I may chime in also, um, we have uh, some invasive species such as garlic mustard and that in some of our areas. So I would highly encourage people if you're going to multiple areas mushroom hunting, um, carry a brush, a stiff brush with you in the car and make sure you brush the dirt and seeds that are in the soles of your shoes uh, before you get in your car so that when you go to the next area, if you have some uh, seeds on your shoes, you aren't carrying invasive species to a new area. Yeah, that's a great point, Jerry. I'm glad you thought of that and brought that up. So Jess, I think uh, I got no more questions coming up from people and it's sub, it's 11.05. Uh, so I think it's time to thank everybody and send them on their way and maybe they can go out and start scouting spots. Oh, one, one quick, should you cut or pull mushrooms? Ooh, another great question. It depends on the mushroom. So, um, and this is another one that people de debate on. Um, some people say like with the merle mushroom, you should only pinch it. Um, but they don't really have a big mycelium mass underneath. So I, I do know some people that pull the mushrooms up. Um, shelf mushrooms, cut them. Try to always cut them. That way you do leave a good portion of it remaining at the on, on that tree to keep growing and propagating. So um, I would say just rule of thumb, go ahead and just cut them. But also some exceptions, some of the mushrooms, um, the guide might, guidebook might tell you, you actually have to dig it up to really be able to ID it. But I say just a good rule of thumb is to go ahead and cut them. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone, for joining us.